Now, we left off at a very, very good study, okay? So I hope that you remember the teaching about dealing uh, with burdens and issues, okay? So it's very important to keep that in mind. So I'm going to review it. That way we can understand, okay? But there is one more verse that I do want to add that can be helpful. So in review and also at adding another point, remember verse 15 is probably one of the most salient verses to deal with uh, counseling or emotional issues, dealing with people who are struggling through a hard time. So the reason why that there's still division in churches, there's a lack of understanding, and then always uh, uh, churches who are not being ministered to properly is because uh, we are not emotional, we are not empathetic. And it is very important to have that. Now, I believe in being tough on sin, and sometimes a person needs nothing but a good rebuke or a kick to finally get the light switch on. However, if a person never cared for sheep, never loved sheep, then you got a problem. Verse 15, we talked about touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That's a very important phrase. So you have to be touched the way that they're feeling. So your touch has to be in sync with their touch. Your feeling has to be in sync with their feelings. Now, obviously, we're all made differently. However, we are supposed to try to be empathetic. We're supposed to try to be in tune. That way we could be more understanding and helpful to people. Uh, one verse that will really help you out is verse, chapter 5, verse 2, believe it or not. Chapter 5, verse 2. The verse says, Who can have compassion on the ignorant? Okay, so there are people who are just ignorant, and you can be frustrated with them. Sometimes you repeated the same things to them, and they don't get the memo, right? But they're just ignorant, and you got to be compassion. And on them that are out of the way, then there are those who are just completely messed up. But you're supposed to be compassionate on those people as well. Here's another one. For that he himself also is com compassed with, inf with infirmity, because you got problems too. You got infirmities too. So remember, that matches well with 4 verse 15, feeling of our infirmities. You have infirmities that, and they have infirmities. That's why you're supposed to be kind to them. Why? So that they can be kind to you one day. We have to understand that. You might think, now this is the problem with people. You might think that, uh, well, people are supposed to understand the problems that I'm going through, but then pro people who have problems that are different from mine, they're just very immature. Whereas I'm mature, but I'm going through problems, so people are supposed to be sync with me, but these people are immature, they gotta wake up uh, concerning their problems. No, then we're all comparing each other, see that? Then the highest is Jesus, and he could say the same thing to you. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus is, remember, he's in touch with your feelings, he understands what you're going through and helps you. Now remember, like I told you before, uh, you have to debase yourself. You have to lower yourself. Uh, we looked at the verses on that one. Uh, plenty of good verses. Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Very good verses on that. If there's somebody that just frustrates you, then chapter 5 verse 2 is good to add. They're just ignorant. Uh, a lot of times, now, this, is just, uh, this may be bad advice, but actually it was very good advice, okay? It helped me, all right? Uh, when you're dealing with sheep, sheep are dumb. That's right. Sheep That's right. are stupid. Right. And that includes yours truly. The first time you would think it's them, and then later on when you're going through a problem, you'd realize just how stupid we are, uh, you are. So then that's what I came to realize, all right? And then what happens is then your pastor starts ranting about how stupid all mankind is, right? <laughs> Why? Because we are really stupid. We are really dumb. By that time, you should, be, you should hear that enough from your pastor, like every single lesson, right? It's like Wednesday night. I, I tell you how stupid mankind is. Sunday morning through our history lesson, I tell you how stupid mankind is, right? What men learn from history is what? Yeah, we're all very stupid, right? Men never learn from history. You would think we would know by now, but we're not. So that advice has been very helpful to me when I heard that from other pastors. And then I came to realize how stupid I was in return after that. So that's verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2. They're ignorant. 
And when you're arguing with someone, listen, this is important for you. When you're arguing with someone, when you're frustrated with someone, you just want to rebuke them or land all fours on it. Remember this, you're, you're dealing with people who are dumb, ignorant, okay? If dumb, ignorant people make you upset, then verse 2, you violated verse 2. It didn't say who can be upset on the ignorant. It says who can have compassion, compassion on the ignorant. Then you got the ones that are even more frustrating, those that are out of the way. So those are people who are totally out of touch. Those are really people out of the way. They're sinners, actually. They're wicked. You're supposed to have compassion on them, too. That's very important. Overall, even when you're dealing with uh, wicked lost souls and street preaching, uh, there is rebuke, preaching hard against sin, but if there is absolutely no compassion in you, then there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with you. Because you've got to realize you could have been one of them too. All right? Could have been one of them too. Just a couple little events, if the devil had permission to put on your life, you would have been one of those guys screaming at the street preacher, totally demon-possessed, taking Jesus' name at vain, spitting at the street preacher. So that's very important to understand. Now, now that we understand chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 4, verse 15, it's very important that from these two verses, even though we're supposed to have compassion on them, that we are not supposed to stay down with, uh, there with them. Remember that? Yeah. We go down to where they're at so we understand what their beliefs are, what their feelings are, and it's our job to get them out of that. Okay? Sometimes you might have to be a little bit more forceful to do that as well. And then rebuke. See that? Now, here's something very good that you want to hear, okay? Whenever you preach hard or whenever you rebuke, it doesn't come without understanding the people first. Did you hear what I said? It, when you rebuke, preach hard. Now, you hear your pastor constantly criticizing, right? Like name-calling people. Like the, uh, Sometimes when you get me in a really bad mood, you see me, right? Like really slam hard. If you want to see your pastor go all out, now, some of you enjoy that, you know, <laughs> but if you want to see your pastor go really all out is, you know, the scholars, right? The educated world, all right? Uh, our liberal government, etc. And queasy Christians. Don't get me there, all right? Queasy pastors. Don't get me there. But it's so important to understand that why would I do all that? See? Why would I say all that? Why would I be sarcastic? It doesn't come without understanding them first, see? It is exactly why I understand what they are that I call out their hand on, correct? Now, this is very important to understand, church, is that that's why you must come with an understanding first, and then you'll know which level of method to take with them. Can I repeat that again? You have to understand the person first, then you know which level of method to take with them. If I go online and I tell apostate pastors, Please don't deceive your sheep with modern Bible versions. No, that ain't going to work with them. All right? You know how I'm going to get their attention? I know exactly how. I title their name in my video, and I call them out, and I'll call them names. Trust me, a bunch of Calvinists will go ballistic and angry, and John MacArthur will hear the news. They, they know me by now, all right? I mean, uh, it's funny. Hank Hanegraaff even mentioned me, believe it or not. So... I've heard Jack Van Impe mention me. I'm not sure if that was true or not, but someone claimed that. But the point is, see, I get their attention. Why? Not because, listen, I'm not an attention seeker. There are those jerks out there who are attention seekers. They just like to cause problems because they like to seek attention. No, I don't do that. You know why I do that? I do that because just saying kindly, please use the King James Bible, is not going to work with those Calvinist scholars. All right, they've been through tons of debates. They've read tons of our articles. They know by now, all right? What they need is a good kick in their rear end, all right? Because they've never been kicked. By doing that, then they'll get the memo from me. And if they don't repent, obviously they won't repent then. But see, you have to come with an understanding first that even the most forceful method will be understandable. Does that make sense? All right, so here's the thing. You can't just say to a kid all the time, no, please don't do that. No, you can't do that. Sometimes you have to discipline them, and I mean hard. 
You have to do that. Even the book of Proverbs says uh, an angry countenance is like the wind that driveth away uh, fighting or division. How about that, right? So think about this. When I'm talking about compassion, understanding, y'all are thinking that, oh, I got to go down to where they're at and stayed right down there with them. That's what the mistake everyone's doing. No, when you're going down with them, when, once you understand them, you know what level of force to take them up in. Sometimes you might have to go, bam, like that. See, good kick. Or you might have to just go there, go like this, because they're so frail, and you might have to do this. All right? Now, in my ministry, it's been like this, and it's been like this. And it might go till the rapture, all right? But do you understand my point? Now, this is going to be extremely helpful is that whenever uh, you deal with people, it must come, it must come with understanding them first. Uh, if there's absolutely no understanding, no compassion, no empathy, then there's going to be something wrong. And then you won't become a successful minister. What does minister mean? You're dealing with people's needs. You're helping them. You can't minister, serve people without understanding the customer, understanding the person first. A minister is actually like a waiter, a server on customers' tables. So you have to understand that. All right, I hope that has been very helpful. Now the next part will be even much more helpful, all right? Because there are some of those who are very empathetic that they get themselves into trouble, all right? Now, let's look at verse 16. Let us therefore, okay, Come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, I, I explained every word in this verse in our last Hebrew study. I won't do it tonight, okay? But now I'm going to explain the additional part to verse 16. So, notice right here that that's why we should come boldly to the throne of grace. If you're going through an infirmity or a problem, that's why you can come boldly unashamedly, see that? That means unashamedly, to the throne. Now notice right here, not to your fellow brother and sister in Christ. You come there. Why? Because that verse, do you read that? It says boldly. Did you see that there? Boldly means something that you're not ashamed about. Do you see that? Now, boldly means unashamed. Now, this has happened, all right, which is why we, uh, you need boundaries, all right? Even liberal law psychologists do boundaries with their clients. You know why? Because it can go way out of proportion with people's feelings, being in touch with their feelings, and then they're just spilling their guts out, and there are just stuff you wish you never heard. All right? Now, boldly unashamed, that violates Scripture then at Ephesians 5. Go to Ephesians 5. Now here's a person, all right? So-and-so in the church just spilled his or her guts out to you in the church, all right? And I know this has happened in our church, okay? And this has happened with other churches who have been in fellowship with our other churches because we're just such great brothers, sisters in Christ. It feels like heaven and, man, you're the greatest friend in the world and then all of a sudden when you're going through a problem, you just want to... And then tell the person all your problems. No. That's right. No. Amen. Okay. Amen. If, if you do that, then uh, you're going to cause problems. All right. Especially if you're thinking bad about somebody else in the church. And you told somebody about your struggle with that person in the church and spilled your guts to that person. That's not good. Good testimony. Okay. What is that? So. That these are things you should, if there's something that is shameful, you're not supposed to tell people that. Let me repeat that again. If there's something that is shameful, you're not supposed to tell people that. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Notice right here that the Bible says at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 12. Verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak... What's a shame to speak? Of those things which are done of them in secret. How about that? See, things that are private, confidential, personal, it's a shame to just speak openly of those things. When you hear about somebody's dirt, 
somebody sinned, you're like, no, all right? Now, here's the thing. You got to realize that uh, I'm not saying that there's not a time and a place to uh, spill your guts, okay? So, for example, I know this, all right? Some, when children are going through something, yeah, you need to tell your parents, all right? Don't hide it from them, okay? If a husband or a wife is going through something personal in their life, they shouldn't keep it a secret from each other. They should tell it to each other, all right? If a member is going through something bad, they should tell it to a pastor. So don't get me wrong. There's a time and a place. Sometimes pastors are filled with pride. They keep things to themselves rather than humbling themselves and seeking another pastor for help. Yeah, amen. So look, there's a time and a place for everything. But remember, but that doesn't mean you can just go out without boundaries and spill your guts out to the whole world. That's the, that's the horrible thing. So Ephesians 5, there are things that, you're ashamed, that are ashamed to speak about openly. That's a big no. Then who do you say it to? The verse already told who you say boldly, unashamedly to. Well, what about this wicked sin that is so vile and wicked that it's totally illegal? That it's totally wrong? That's totally, yeah, you tell him because he already knows. See, he is the ultimate comforter. There is no doubt about it. There are just clients who are just so wicked, vile, grievous that psychologists just can't handle. But Jesus Christ can handle them. Isn't that amazing? There are just some sins that get you kicked out of the church that we can't allow you back for. But Jesus Christ, he can still forgive you if you come to him repentance. Now that's the ultimate comforter. See that? So boldly should be to him not to so-and-so. That's very important to understand. Now, here's another thing. Uh, remember in, when we go back to Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4? What did I comment before at Hebrews 4, 15? Jesus Christ is our high priest, correct? If Jesus Christ is our high priest, then that means there must be lower priest, right? If there are lower priests, who's that? That's us. And uh, remember, I showed you that verse at Revelation chapter 1, right? I don't know if I did that. If I didn't, then I apologize. You can look up Revelation chapter 1. But the first seven verses, I believe, would point out that we are all kings and priests. Now, what am I trying to drive at? That verse says you're supposed to come boldly confessing your sin, right, to your high priest. But if you decide to tell it to your brother and sister in Christ who are priests, then you're confessing your sin to a priest. Right. Lower. We Christians totally are anti on that. Do you believe in confessing sins to a priest? You and I don't believe in that. That's totally wicked. All right. That's so evil. All right. These, there are just horror stories with Roman Catholic confessions all the way to the dark ages to now today. It's so dirty and filthy. You never want to confess sins uh, to people. You never want to confess sins to priests. So go to James. This is a standard verse, right? Catholic apologists will try to use James chapter 5. Well, you got to confess your sins one to another. That's not what it said. All right? Those are things you should be ashamed about. All right? That should not be spoken. All right? Go to James chapter 5, verse 16. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your sins one to another. Is that right? If you got a modern Bible version, some of them do. Some of them say sins. No, it's not sins. It's your fault one to another. Why? There's a difference. Keep your hand here and go to Matthew 18. Go to Matthew 18. Now keep your hand at James 5. What's the difference? The difference is it's all your fault. What does that mean? That means putting a blame on somebody for the wrong that the person did against that person. So in other words, what the fault is, is the wrong doing or your fault, what you did against that person. That's what God wants confession. Not, Brother Max, I got a marijuana addiction. Please don't tell anybody this. No, yeah. it's more like, Brother Max, I apologize to you because I got angry with you at that one day. See that? What's that? That's because of something I have against him. Right. 
that I'm supposed to confess to. That's what the Bible's saying, confessing faults. What does confessing faults mean? What wrongdoing you did to each other. Okay? Not dumping all your dirty little secrets. My goodness. The Max ain't going to come to this church ever again. He's going to think I'm the nut after this, you know? So, so the thing is, okay, y'all were kind of slow on that one, all right? Some of you thought it wasn't funny. Never mind, all right? Matthew, Matthew uh, 18, Matthew 18. I apologize, all right? Go to Matthew chapter 18. Now go to verse 15. This verse defines you what the fault is. All right? Matthew 18, 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass, what? Against thee, go and tell him what? His fault. See that? Okay. Now, here's something important, all right? The confessing, the, even the fault itself, where, oh, boom, I got to tell you this problem. What that is, is also, keep re reading this, tell him his fault between what? That shows the privacy. So even with the fault that you're supposed to confess openly, the verse even told you there should be boundaries on this. You know one thing I've seen at churches? Then, and then? And then it's like, ah! All right? Now, what I do immediately when there are issues like that, I put a stop to it immediately. I want to know what was going on and who found out. That way we can talk to those specific parties about the fault and then prevent it from reaching to more people. Okay, if there was something that bad that happened in the church, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to tell you. You might say, well, you should tell us. No, you don't, because you don't want us to tell yours. <laughs> All right? And the verse said you're not supposed to. Well, isn't there a sin you're supposed to tell to the church? Yeah, if, if it's not resolved with these individuals and it's not resolved with these individuals, then you tell the whole church. Look at the steps here. Verse 15, you do it privately. Why? So it's safe. You can regain the brother. Verse 16, if that don't work, then you get other people involved, all right? If the pastor's the last one at verse 16, you got problems, man. <laughs> if I hear that all the church knows about the problem and the pastor's the last one to hear it, then it's, the church is already done and ruined, all right? So this is good. Uh, let me just add this to my church. If something like this happens, please, please, all right? Make sure that it's only this. And if it's spreading to another person, you better let me know about that. If I'm the last one, our church is in trouble. Do you understand? So I want to add that, okay? I want to add that. Why? Because I'm the leader. I'm accountable for all the people. And then I know how to put a stop to that one before it just spreads the fire. And then Bible Baptist Church will then contact beep, 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 14 hours, you know, drive to San Diego, then to Imperial Beach. Then somehow it does happen. It reaches all the way to the northeast side to Florida. <laughs> And then I'm the last one to know, and I'm like, one the world. Yeah, wow. We don't want that. Yeah. All right? Y'all yeah. were encouraged about dumping your problems, and people should be empathetic, but that don't mean that you don't do it without boundaries. Yeah. All right, so now, verse 16, that's when you get other people involved if it's not resolved. If the problem's not resolved yet. Then verse 17, then you tell it to the whole church. All right? In other words, what does that mean? The church should be the last, not the first. Yeah. If the whole church knows within three days or a week, then you got a gossip problem. That's not just, oh, I need help with my problem. No, you're gossiping. Okay? All right. Now, um, we go back, okay? We go back to Hebrews. All right, I hope that's been very helpful. So remember this. If you got a problem and it's so heavy and you need to be bold about it, there's only one, and that's Jesus Christ, all right? So that's the boundary line. So if someone comes to you boldly and you're getting freaked out, you know what you should do? You got to say, that's something you need to pray to the Lord about, not to me. That is very good advice, all right? If you're empathetic, see, that's the problem. If you're compassionate and empathetic, trying to be in touch with the feelings of the infirmities of somebody when it's something to be ashamed about, 
then you've crossed the line. All right? So that's when, if it's something that's shameful, that's a bad testimony, you draw the line and say, no, 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 I don't want to know about it. You got to pray to the Lord about that. Okay? Now, here are uh, several rules that I want to repeat again that will be helpful to the church. Let's sum up everything of Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. Okay? All right. One, we have to be compassionate to people, understanding. No matter how low and frustrating it is that you have to, uh, that you think of those people, you got to go down with them. Understood? You, can, uh, you have to do that. Don't be bitter. Don't start church fights. Don't be uh, hard on those people. You need to go down to where they're at. You have to be compassionate, understanding. Number two, when you're compassionate, understanding to their level, that don't mean you stay down there with them. All right? What you have to do is you have to pick them up. You have to pick them up. Number three, number three is... When, when you have to use uh, a little bit of force or even very strong force to pick them up, maybe a hard rebuke, maybe discipline, all right? When it comes to something like that, it don't come without first going down, understanding them first. If you try that, it will simmer a lot of fights, actually. Good. All right? So you got to understand them first. That's number three. Number four... Showing empathy to people does not mean that they should boldly come to you. That's something shameful. If that happens, then they're doing the wrong thing. And if you're doing that, you're doing the wrong thing. There's only one being you should do that boldly to, that is to Jesus Christ. All right? We don't believe in confessing sins to a priest. We believe in confessing sins to the high priest. Amen? Amen. That should be very helpful. All right, well, what number am I? Five or six? Okay. Four. Four? Okay, so now I'm in five, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, number five. Uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, oh, what was number five? Oh, yeah, number five. Okay. Always think of the right time, the right place, and the right person at the right level to disclose your problem. Can I repeat that again? There's always a right time, a right place, a right person, and a right level to disclose a problem to a person. I add that last part in because I don't want people to think that if they're carrying this baggage that they can't tell anybody. No, there are uh, sometimes Look, if there's a child that's struggling with something very, very dark, the mother and father would want to know. All right? But that person, place, and time, and level is far different than a person who's carrying this dark thing and then confessing it to Brother Max. All right? When he's not even related to you by blood. All right? right. He wouldn't want to know that. All right? He probably, you know, sit in the way back from you after that. All right? So that's why it's so important. See, it's not the right level, Tim. It's not the right person. It's not the right place. It's definitely not the right timing. <laughs> right. So remember, when you do that, it will be helpful. Here's another thing. Let's say you come to the pastor with the problem. You came to the right person. You set up the right time. You're in the right place. It's in a counseling room. But the right level. See? So when you disclose... And sometimes when you come to me with, for counseling, you've noticed your pastor going, okay, I don't need to know anymore, actually. Just keep it as general and vague as possible. Right? You see me do that before? Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't know if there was anyone, but there were some, all right? I just took, it just can't pop in my mind. Don't, don't nod your heads, please, all right? Then everyone will know. So, but anyway, but you know what I mean, right? So I would, uh, so see, notice that the level is being controlled. Sometimes uh, full disclosure uh, will have to be met, but that comes at the right level. You just can tell when you talk. When you talk, you can tell. All right, the Holy Spirit will guide you and you can tell. 
All right, uh, I hope that was very helpful to you, okay? We all, okay, know these, uh, are, there, are those five rules I gave? Yeah, okay, five rules, all right? Very good rules. I want you to keep in mind, that way there's no problem in the future, okay? All right, um, chapter five, verse one. Now we begin, chapter five and verse one. All right, thank you, brother. All right. The Bible says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God. Okay, in other words, remember, I'm going to explain each and every word. Every high priest that you can think of throughout the Old Testament, Paul is arguing, they were uh, taken from among the people. Anybody who was ordained or who was uh, elected to become the high priest among the people they were uh, ordained based on the reason to minister, to help out men, to help out people in things that related to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. So what he does to minister to the people or serve the people is that he offers up uh, to the Lord gifts and sacrifices for sins. And that's all over throughout the Bible. You'll see uh, animal sacrifices when people commit a sin that the high priest will have to uh, put, but also gifts. Sometimes there has to be gifts made to the Lord in dealing with issues. Verse 2, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on, and on them that are out of the way? So the high priest is able, when he does those sacrifices, he, his job is also to have compassion on people who are ignorant. And those who are uh, completely out of the way, that's sinful. Okay, so if you look, uh, we're not going to look at all those verses, but write down Leviticus chapter 4. All right, Leviticus chapter 4. You'll see examples of people sinning through ignorance. In other words, they don't know what they did was wrong. So the high priest was uh, understandable. Remember these, like I told you before, dumb sheep, right? People are dumb. They just don't know what they did was wrong. So in Leviticus chapter 4, uh, that's a good chapter to deal with the sins of ignorance. Sins of ignorance. So the high priest had to take care of that one. Those that are out of the way definitely means those who are not in the way. Those who are really wicked sinners. The example is Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. So the high priest is supposed to be compassion for those who are uh, sinners and those who were ignorant about the sin. All right, Romans chapter 3. Notice right here that the verse is pointing out uh, those who are definitely in sin. In verse 17, verse 17, and the way of peace have they not known. So they're not in the way. You'll notice that. Verse 12, verse 12, they are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay, so that's pretty plain. Those people are sinners. The idea is if you're following the way, if you're in the straight and narrow way, you've heard that, right? What that means is those are doing right. If you're getting out of the way, those are doing plainly sinning. Okay, Hebrews 5, 2 again. The middle part for that, he himself also is compassed with infirmity. Because the high priest, he himself is also surrounded with his weaknesses, with his infirmities, with his sins, which is why he can be compassionate on those who are ignorant and those who are sinners. A lot of time, let me add this, okay, is uh, these people were ordained by God. Ministers are ordained by God too. It's so important, this is a problem with Bible-believing ministers who develop pride and God don't use their ministries anymore, and I've seen them. The reason why that happens to them, where they are not compassionate on people, those who are ignorant, those who are just really out of the way, is because they think they never suffered the same weaknesses and problems. But then when they get caught with a scandal, if they're still stuck in pride, then you know what they'll do? These wicked demon-possessed pastors, they'll cover their, themselves and still not show compassion on people. Yeah. All right, I met them disgusted me. If you want me to give up my Bible-believing Christian life, let me tell you this, to be just plainly honest with you. I could have given it up several times because I know certain names and certain Bible believers that it would have just turned your stomach and I would not have been a Bible-believing pastor. So if people say, well, church has been unfair, pastor has been unfair, the Lord's been unfair, so that's why I became atheist. No, I would have, I had better excuses. All right, I've seen it myself. 
What you're going to do is you'll find it in any group or organization, not just the church. So stop picking on a church. OK. But anyways, returning to this main text right here, that's why the Lord will sometimes put you through a hard time, expose your weaknesses so that you can finally become compassionate on people. And there have been Bible believing pastors that I've talked to some names that you would be surprised where uh, they actually told me that they've softened up more through this trial, through this suffering. All right, let's look. So if you don't want the Lord to put you through a hard trial to humble you, you might as well learn the lesson now. Amen. Uh, be very nitpicky, not on other people's problems, but your problems. If you're extremely nitpicky on your own problems, you tend to be compassionate on other people's problems. Okay, now let's look at chapter 5, verse 3. And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. So because of that reason where everyone is affected by infirmities, by sins, that's why he ought to offer up sacrifices of the sins of the people, including himself. That's what chapter 5 verse 3 is saying. All right. Now remember how I'm explaining. See if it matches every word there. All right. Chapter 5 verse 4. Chapter 5 verse 4. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. In other words, nobody takes this kind of honor, this kind of status to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. They can't take it themselves. Only those who are called by God. You might recall Aaron was specifically called by God to do that. He was a first high priest. Verse 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest. But he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So in other words, just like Aaron, Christ also didn't glorify himself, didn't exalt himself to a position of the high priest. It was only because of the one who said to him, God the Father, who said to him that he became exalted to the position of the high priest. And the one that said to him, use these following words. You are my son. It's this day that, I, uh, that you, I gave birth to you. Now, you might recall that that verse is again repeated from Psalm chapter 1, I believe. And that, uh, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 1. And the cross-reference is Psalm 2-7, all right? That cross-reference is Psalm 2-7. We won't look there because we looked at our previous Hebrew study on that one. And we know what that meant. That meant uh, when Jesus Christ was born on this earth, that was the day when Jesus was begotten. All right, verse 6, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. God the Father also said in another scripture place that you are a priest and it's not temporarily, it's forever. Once you're a priest, you will always be a priest, Jesus. And the priesthood is the Melchizedekian priest line, not the Levitical priest line. Now, why is that distinction made? Because Melchizedek's priesthood is before the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood is based on Aaron, and that started at Exodus. Melchizedek's priesthood was mentioned all the way back at Genesis 13. Genesis chapter, uh, was it 14, excuse me, Genesis 14. So Melchizedek, we have to understand, he, he was not a Hebrew priest, see? Because the Levites were the first Hebrew priest. Melchizedek was during the time of Abraham, Genesis 14. So he's not a Jew, so he's a Gentile. So Melchizedek, we'll cover him later on more about his identity, I covered a, a significant portion about him at our studies in Genesis, but I'll repeat it again at Hebrews. Anyways, returning back, uh, we'll cover him later in Hebrews. But for now, just know that Melchizedek's priesthood is superior to Aaron's. That's the bottom line. So if Jesus is in that Melchizedekian priesthood, that means he's superior to Aaron, the very first high priest. So the author, he's trying to point out the superiority of Jesus Christ's priesthood. We already saw 
at uh, chapter 1, Jesus superior to divine, uh, to the angelic beings, right? We saw that at chapter 1, and we saw that at chapter 2. We also saw at chapter 3, Jesus being superior to Moses, Jesus' house being superior to Moses' house. Now the author is trying to argue about Jesus' priesthood superior to Aaron's priesthood. The reason why is he's speaking to Hebrews. So he's trying to mainly point out that Jesus is not your average Jew. He's trying to convince the Hebrews this man is much superior, if not God himself. And he mentioned that in a few places. All right. Now, we're wondering, ch Hebrews chapter 5, verse 6, what scripture is the author quoting? The scripture is Psalm 110, verse 4. Psalm chapter 110 and verse 4. So you want to mark that one down. All right, I'll read that uh, quickly in your Old Testament. So because it's from Hebrew to English, it'll be worded a little differently from the New Testament, which was in Greek to English. Okay. So Psalm chapter 110, and then we'll read verse 4. The Bible reads here. Oh, man, I'm taking forever to find that verse. Okay. Here we go. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is speaking about Jesus Christ because of verse 1. See, that's not David. It's Jesus. The Lord said unto my Lord. All right, let's go back here. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. So the author, he's not pulling verses out of thin air. He's using verses that really refer to Jesus the Messiah. He's proving that. Because Psalm 110, that ain't David. What else is that referring to? If not Jesus, at least a superior being. Then who is that superior being? If not Jesus. So the author, he, he's trying to convince the Jews it's got to be Jesus, see? And he is a superior being, if not God himself. All right, let's look at verse 7. So speaking of Jesus, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. Okay, so Jesus, during his days of being a human, he offered up, so this is like a high priest who gave offerings to the Father, right? But in this offering, it's prayers, and supplication. Supplication goes in line with prayer for some of you who don't know. It also means the same thing. It's request. That's what supplication means. It means a request. So he offered prayer, supplications, and he cried heavily that tears came out. To who? Who is he crying with tears to? Unto him that was able to save him from death. He was crying out to God who had the power to save him from death. And was heard in that he feared. So his prayer was heard. So God answered Jesus' prayer because he was fearful about this death. Okay, now this is an important passage. This is where this uh, nice little drawing will come to the scene here, okay? So uh, let me move toward this side. I don't think we're going to cover uh, this part of the picture tonight, but we'll see. All right. This is where all the commentators mess up, okay? So you want to pay attention to this. <laughs> a lot of people assume from this verse that this was the prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. They assume Jesus Christ, he was praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. He was praying so heavily that he was crying with tears, Oh God, save me from dying on the cross. I do not want to die on the cross. That is not true, okay? So go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Now, you might recall that Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. That was his prayer, correct? So there are two wrong assumptions here. This is the problem. Two wrong assumptions. What did Jesus fear? So they say that he feared to die on the cross, which they believe is the cup. That was the cup that Jesus had to drink, that Jesus begged, oh, my father, let this cup pass from me which is referring to him dying on the cross. That's what they assume. So go to the book of Matthew chapter 26. <coughs> Matthew 26, verse 38, verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Oh, so he's crying up to death. That seems to match nicely with Hebrews, see? 
Tarry ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So it seems to match up nicely, but there is a problem, okay? The problem is in Hebrews chapter uh, 5 and verse uh, 7, the verse was that God heard his prayer. So God answered his prayer. That's the idea. Right. Why God never answered Jesus' prayer about letting the cup pass from him, he had to die. Because you'll notice right here, um, Mm. Uh, I didn't f uh, find that verse, but we do know this is that Jesus Christ, uh, he took that cup, right? He took that cup and drank it for them. So that, so God didn't answer that prayer. That's the bottom line. So then when God, uh, so that the verse said right here, uh, Strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. So it shows right here a granting of the request to save him from death, but obviously he wasn't. Yeah. So then what's the confusion here? The confusion is two things. What did it mean that he, was, he wanted to be saved from death? And then what is this cup? All right, so let's first clarify the cup, okay? Okay. The cup is not dying on the cross. The cup is God's wrath against sin. So go to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. It's God's wrath against sin. Look at Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 28. Now think about this. When we think about uh, when we talk about the wrath of God, what comes in our mind? Hell, right? Okay, now keep, just keep that in mind. Because that's where all sin goes to. Jeremiah chapter 25. <coughs> Notice that the word of God reads right here that it's referring to verse 28. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup at thine hand to drink, then shalt thou say... Unto them, thus saith the Lord of hosts, ye shall certainly drink. So it's referring to that cup. But look at verse 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city, which is called by my name. And sh should ye be utterly unpunished, ye shall not be unpunished. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth, saith the Lord of hosts. So notice right here that this is God's wrath against sinners. So he takes that very seriously, which a lot of people don't understand about. When uh, they take the cup of God's wrath, it's God's punishment against sin itself. And when it covers about uh, mankind's sin, think about this. Jesus Christ then would be likened to those sinners. So then when Jesus Christ is taking uh, the cup of God's wrath, it's pouring upon him Jesus being a sinner, deserving the punishment of God's wrath. You follow? Now, would a holy God want that or he would hate that? Obviously, he hate it because he's a holy God. He don't deserve the wrath against sin. He don't deserve that. To do that is such a disgrace to his holiness. So that's what Jesus Christ dreaded the most, and that's the reason why Jesus Christ never... Uh, wanted that cup, but we do know that uh, he had to take the cup and thank God that he did so that we could be saved from hell. Uh, he took it, uh, the place for you and I. Look at John, uh, Psalm 75. Psalm 75. We'll look at verse 8, Psalm 75. We'll read verse 8. Notice that the wicked, the sinful people, are those who have to drink out of it. Psalm 75. <coughs> Notice verse 8. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup, right? And the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth shall wring them out and drink them. See, Jesus did not want to drink the cup, right? 
Why? Because the wicked are the ones who drink the cup. See, he didn't want anything to do that, with that. Here's another one. Go to Isaiah 51. Go to Isaiah 51. A lot of people misunderstand what this cup is. They think that it has to do with the cross. No, this cup is referring to God's wrath against sin. God's wrath against sin. Go to Psalm 51. Notice what the Bible says at verse 17, verse 17. Uh, Isaiah, excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> I'm all over. Isaiah 51, 17. The Bible says, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Now has drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. All right, notice right here the cup of God's wrath. Verse 22. Thus saith thy Lord, the Lord, and thy God that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. All right, so it's the cup of God's wrath. So remember, this is the wrath of God against sin, not dying on the cross. Let me repeat that again. The cup is not dying on the cross. It is God's wrath against sin. So think about it. What is God's wrath against sin if not hell? So we see right here that hell is God's wrath against sin. Here's another thing to think about. Didn't you know that uh, hell is in line with death? Mm -hmm. The Bible says uh, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. There are many verses that point out how hell is death. That's why Jehovah Witnesses confuse the two, death and hell. They think they're the same. And hence they say hell is death or hell is the grave. But when the Bible talks about death right here, it's referring to this guy's power. All right, It's not, it's not referring to just dying, dropping dead. Not that very action. What it is, is it's referring to a place. It's referring to a place, which is the underworld. The underworld, this is the realm of the dead here. This is where hell is located. He's got the power. Now look at this, okay? Hebrews said he feared, right? Save him from death was heard in that he feared. Notice that matches with what we read before. Did you forget Hebrews 2? Go back there, Hebrews 2. Notice the wording there. Hebrews 2. The Old Testament saints were a lifetime in bondage, afraid of death, because they didn't know where they would go after they died. Yeah. Why? Because they didn't go to heaven. That wasn't the place they went. The place they went was the realm of the dead, which they have no idea about what it's capable of. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15. Uh, and deliver them who through what? Fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. That was Jesus' job. That's why he, had, he wanted to be saved from this. Why? He had to go there to save them from there. All right, look at verse 14, Hebrews 2, 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself, Jesus, likewise took part of the same. That through death, see, he had to do that, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, because he's in the devil's grasp here. See that? So, that was the place that he feared. All right, here's another one. Go to Acts chapter 2, if you don't believe me. Go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, notice what the Bible says about uh, Jesus Christ. In verse 23, Acts 2.23. So remember, Jesus cried to God to save him from death. Was that prayer answered? Yes. Because look at Acts 2.23. Him, Jesus, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. All right, so that's where he died. That's the action he died. That's not what Jesus feared. That's not what Jesus was saved from. It's the place... Look at verse 24, 24. Whom God hath what? Raised. Raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right. See that? It's referring to the realm of the dead here. It's that place. 
Why do you think Jesus Christ, that's why he had power over death? Why do you think that when people die, they don't go down here anymore? They can go to heaven. Because he had to go down there and overcome it. That makes a lot more sense. So for some of you who don't know, you can write down Luke 16, Luke 16. But long story short, and I'm not going to really go on a full spiel here, but Luke 16 shows that in this realm of the dead, there is a place called paradise, and there is a place which is actual hell. So this whole location is hell, but it has a place of comfort and a place of torment in Luke 16. What we like to call it, and it is scriptural, is paradise, and then we want to call this place of torment hell. And Luke 16 is evidence of that. So in this realm of the dead, or hell, there are two areas. Actually, there's multiple areas, but we'll just cover two. There's, mul uh, there's two areas, and that is an actual place of torment where lost people go, hell, and then another place where people are in a place of comfort called paradise. So Jesus Christ, he had to go down there. And obviously, it's going to be a fearful thing because he's in the devil's territory now. He gave up himself to sin. So now he's in sin's grasp now. He's in hell's grasp, the devil's grasp. Jesus took on the whole nature of sin. Sin belongs in hell. Do you understand that? So he's locked up in there. That's why he uh, had strong crying and tears, because he had to pray to God the Father to deliver him out of that. All right, so... Did God answer his prayer? Absolutely. That's why he got out. And look at Revelation 1. Revelation 1. Why do you think he has the keys of hell and death? Why do you think he has the keys of hell and death? Unless he went down to this place where death and hell reigned. Does that make sense? Even Revelation 6 shows when the fourth seal is unleashed, death came out and hell followed with him. Those, uh, those two, uh, they're interlinked with each other, you have to understand. Those two are interlinked with each other. So go to uh, Revelation chapter 1. Notice verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. That's Jesus. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. So he got out. He's got the keys. So that's what Jesus feared. Jesus did not fear like dying. See that? Like Boom, I die. The act of dying on the cross. It's more that he feared this place. See? It's the place that he was fearful of. That matched with Hebrews 2, with those Old Testament saints. They were afraid of that because they didn't know where they would end up in. All right, uh, hopefully that's been very helpful. And then uh, we'll go back. We have a few more minutes, so let's uh, read a few verses. Okay, so let's look at Hebrews... Uh, Five, Hebrews 5, verse 8. <laughs> though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So even though Jesus Christ is a son, he's God the son, right? He has that title, that respectable position. He still learned to become obedient. He debased himself and uh, went through suffering. Things which he suffered, he learned obedience. He learned many things. Verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So Jesus Christ, because of that humility he went through, through that stage of suffering, through that stage of learning, he became perfect. Now remember, that doesn't mean that he sinned. Uh, I showed you that perfection, it shows a stage of completeness. So Jesus Christ was going through a perfection process. He was going through a stage of completion, through a learning process. I'm not going to expound on that. That was already explained before at Hebrews chapter 2, I think. All right. So after he completed that perfection uh, process, he is now qualified to become the author of eternal salvation. So now everyone is saved, and Jesus Christ is the author of that. We go to him. Everybody who obeys him will be able to attain that salvation. And that sounds like you got to do good works for salvation, right? But no, that's not true. Okay, go to Romans chapter 10. 
Romans chapter 10 and Romans 16. Go to Romans 10 and Romans 16. You know how you obey him? It's very simple. How do you obey him for salvation? If he told you as a repentant sinner, put your trust on my son's sacrifice for salvation. Believe by faith what I did on the cross that it will save you. How many people have obeyed that? You and I did, right? So that means we're saved, see? But how many people who do good works are disobeying that? See? So that's what the obedience is. Look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Notice that the Bible points out at verse 21. Romans 10, verse 21. But to Israel, he saith, All day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a what? Disobedient and gainsaying people. What are they disobedient about? They're disobedient about the gospel, obviously. Verse 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What are they disobedient about? Uh, look at verse 16, Romans 10, 16. But they have not all obeyed the what? For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath what? Believed our report. See, it's because they just didn't believe the gospel. They didn't obey it. Look at Romans 16, chapter 16. Verse 26, Romans 16, 26, and we'll call it a night. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of what? Faith, not works. All right. So that proves right there that the obedience is referring to just simply, uh, it's just obeying what God told you to get saved. Yeah, it's that simple. Okay, um, we, so in Hebrews 5, 9, you can tell by the point of the author here is that those Jews, they're not obeying it. Those Hebrews aren't obeying it. That's why he said at Romans 10, 21, Israel is a disobedient. Yeah. Israel is being disobedient. So he's trying to convince them of that. Okay, uh, we'll continue on our Hebrew study uh, next Wednesday. Father God, I pray that tonight's teachings have been a blessing to the hearers. We learned a lot and we'll apply them in our lives and be able to grow more spiritually in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.